onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. All right, well, I want to welcome you here this day, and uh, we're here to discuss something that's important and precious to the heart of our God, that is his gospel. And before we begin, let's pray together. Let's bow. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord God, we, we come into your presence with thanksgiving. We come into your presence with praise. We thank you, Father, that we can call you our Father, our Abba, and we know this is only possible through your Son, your eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer, our Master. Father, as we gather ourselves together this day, we do pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move freely among us. Lord, you know our needs. We ask that you will inform our minds, warm our hearts, give us a holy enthusiasm for you and the things that are precious to you. May your priorities become our priorities. And Lord God, as we all have just a limited time in this world, we pray that we will yield ourselves to you as vessels, instruments that you might fill with your spirit and use to spread the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, to those who are around us. We entrust our time, our lives into your hands, and we pray this now through your dear son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're here today to, uh, to talk about evangelism. And so perhaps the first thing I should ask you is, what is evangelism? What is it? Why, why is it important? We who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are only believers in the Lord Jesus Christ because someone cared about us enough, loved us enough to bring us a message. And that message is a particular message. It's not something that's just broad and general. It's something that's very specific. The gospel has components to it. Let me show you something in the book of Galatians that highlights to you the accuracy and the importance of the gospel. So if you take your Bibles, and I hope you have your Bibles with you, but when we look in Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul has a real concern for the church here. Some people came in, and they began to tinker with the gospel. They began to tell these believers in the churches of Galatia things that were contrary to what the Apostle Paul had brought to them originally and, and initially. If we look in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, I'm, I'm astonished, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting from him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a, notice what he says, a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and who want to distort or pervert what? The gospel of Christ. Now Paul says this in 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be what? Let him be accursed. Let him be anathematized. Let him be condemned, condemned, condemned to hell forever. Now, Paul says that once, but now, for emphasis, he repeats himself in verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The gospel is very exact. It's very specific. It's very precise. If we add to the gospel, not the gospel any longer. If we take away from the gospel, it's not the gospel any longer. The gospel cannot be improved upon. And you stop and think about it. You can get everything in this world right, but if you get the gospel wrong, you lose everything. So the most important message in the entirety of the universe is the gospel message. And if we're preaching a perverted gospel, then Paul says we're condemned. 
So, as James says, don't be many teachers because the teacher is going to receive the greater judgment. So we want to understand the mind of God, which is revealed to us in Holy Scripture, especially when it comes to this very important message. Now, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, it's because you heard the gospel, and by the grace of God, you've repented and you've believed the gospel. Let me show you something else. Let's turn from here and let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. Now, as you go through this first chapter, the Apostle Paul uh, speaks much to us about the cross of Jesus Christ. You, you see it in verse 17 of chapter 1. We're going to go to 2 verse 2 in a second. But Paul says here, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to do what? To preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be emptied of its power. The next verse, 1 Corinthians 1.17, for the word or the preaching of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Look down in chapter 2 and verse 2. 2.2. Two. Paul says, I decided, I determined to know nothing among you except, see what it says there? I've determined, I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What's Paul saying there? He's saying there's something central to my ministry, something that's so essential to my ministry, and what is it? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's Paul's shorthand of way, uh, way of saying, my main concern is the person of Christ and the work of, right? When we're talking about evangelism, that's our main concern. So if we get the person wrong, if we are believing in or teaching uh, another Jesus, a Jesus other than the Jesus who's made known to us in the pages of the Holy Scripture, or if we don't understand the completed redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ, now we enter into the realm of a false gospel. So we have to really understand what the Bible tells us about Jesus Christ, who he really is, and what he really did. And if the Jesus of the scriptures is misunderstood, then he couldn't have done what he came into the world to do. Now, we already touched upon this idea of the cross, right? Again, I remind you in 117, Paul talks about the, the cross of Christ. He mentions the cross of Christ in 118. If we uh, go down in uh, a little bit further in chapter 1, Paul tells us in verse 18, for Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. Verse 23, that may be what they're all about, but Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, which is, st which is stumbling block to the Jews and is foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and he is the wisdom of God. Now, when we're talking about this content, we know it's about the person of Christ and, and the work of Christ. So who is the true Jesus? Who is the biblical Jesus? In 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, let me ask you to turn there for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul gives us another heads up, another warning. And he says in verse 3, he says, I'm, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived or beguiled or tricked Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul says in, in verse 4, for if someone comes and proclaims what? 
another Jesus than the one we proclaim to you, or if you received a, a different spirit, another spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a, a different gospel than the one you accepted. Paul says, sarcastically, you, you seem to be putting it up with this readily enough. There are false Jesuses out there. There are false spirits out there, spirits other than the Holy Spirit of God. There are false gospels out there. So again, who is the real Jesus? What does the Scripture say? Why did He really come into the world? What's this talk about the cross all about? When we talk about the person of Christ, who are we to understand Him to be? Again, if we look in Scriptures, we think about John chapter 1. We look at the opening verses of John's prologue in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Who is the Word that was with God? Who is the Word that was God? Who is the Word that made all things? Well, we're told in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Matthew 1, 23, one of the names that were to be attributed to Jesus is that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so we see the second person of the Blessed Trinity, second person of the Blessed Trinity who comes into the world and he becomes perfect man. In Matthew chapter 1, we read about this virgin conception. Right? Why is that important? Some people say, well, this idea of a virgin conception and birth, that's, really, that's not really important. That's, that's irrelevant, or that's a nice myth, or that's a, a wonderful sounding tale. But is it important? Is it important for us to believe in the virgin conception of Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary? Well, it's important because it's set forth in Scripture very straightforwardly, very dogmatically. We find this in not only Matthew 1, but we find it also in Luke's Gospel. And why is it, why is it important? Because it ensures Jesus' sinless humanity. Since he doesn't come into this world by normal human generation, but through this special manner, he's preserved from original sin. We're all the offspring of fallen parents. And, and, and as we have children, we pass this, this, this sin nature on to our children. But Jesus has to come into this world sin-free because of the purpose that he's coming into the world to accomplish. Matthew, Matthew 1.21, the angel said to Joseph, call his name Jesus. Why? He will. Mission. He will save his people from their sin. Sin's the major problem, and we need a Redeemer to save us, to deliver us from the penalty and the consequences of our sin. So the Lord Jesus comes into this world, and he's born into this world without original sin. He's not tainted by sin at all, as we are, because of we're the fallen offspring of Adam and Eve, and so that sin Nature is passed from generation to generation to generation, but Jesus is sinless, sin-free. He does always those things that please his Father. That's important because not only does he earn eternal life, but then he goes to the cross. The wages of sin is death, says Paul in Romans 6.23, but Jesus didn't have any sin, so he didn't deserve to die. But he came into the world to save sinners. And so he offers up himself at the cross of Calvary, the sinless, perfect Son of God, takes upon himself the sins of his people, and he's judged in the place of hell-deserving sinners. We call it the substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter puts it, for, for he who knew no sin became... Well, this is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he who knew no sin became sin on behalf of sinners so that in Christ, by faith, we can receive the righteousness of God. We have to understand that Jesus is God 
the eternal Son of God who becomes perfect man. And as man, he lives his perfect life, he goes to the cross, and he lays down his life as a substitutionary sacrifice, as an offering on behalf of his people. And he takes their condemnation, their judgment, the wrath of God that we deserve because we're lawbreakers is now coming down on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he pays for our sin. Take a look at this passage. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians. And let's go to the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, uh, I like to think in broad terms. When, when I hear a chapter of the Bible mentioned, I try to have a picture in my mind of what that chapter is generally about. For example, if I said to you, what's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about? You would say it's about, about love. If I say to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, generally it's about the... Well, it's about the gospel, but it's the longest chapter on the resurrection in the entire Bible. So the Apostle Paul is main concern as he goes through 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is about the resurrection. Now, we can be assured if we're true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to be resurrected physically and bodily one day because what happened? Because Jesus is the first fruits of those who died, right? He physically resurrected and so all who believe in him, trust in him, rely on him alone as Lord and Savior, well, just as he rose physically and bodily from the dead, we're going to have glorified bodies fashioned like unto his glorified body. But there were some people in the church in Corinth who were questioning whether their loved ones would be raised from the dead. And so that's how Paul develops his argument as he goes through this, this chapter. What I want to point out to you right now in light of what we're discussing here are the opening four verses because we're concerned about the gospel, right? We want to know this message that is so exact, so precise, so specific. We're getting some details now on this. Verse 1, Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the what? Gospel. I preach to you, which you received, and which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Now, what was it that Paul delivered to these people in Corinth? Remember, this this was just a group of pagan people. They had all kinds of idols. And Paul came into town, and Paul began preaching the gospel. And there's content to the gospel. He says, I delivered to you as of first or primary importance that which I also received. And, and what, what are the bare bones? He gives us the skeleton of the gospel. What, what, is, what is it? You look at it. Christ, what? He died for our, call his name Jesus, he'll save his people from their sin, right? Christ died for our sins, and he did it in accordance with the scriptures. Everything in the Old Testament was predicting and pointing to and prophesying about this one who would come into the world to be the perfect Lamb of God who would lay down his life on behalf of sinners. All the sacrifices and the temple ritual of the Old Testament were all types and shadows pointing us to this one, this Christ, this Messiah who would die for our sins. So it's in accordance with the Scriptures. The gospel that we find in the New Testament, well, we find it in the Old Testament. It's just when we get to the New Testament, it's more fully developed. We understand more now. It's not just this concept of, of Messiah or the Christ in the Old Testament, but now we know his name. We know his name is Jesus. And he's the one who dies for our sins. And when we look at the next verse, why does Paul add there that he was buried? died. He's emphasizing to us the fact he was really dead. You don't, you don't bury living people or people who are unconscious. So again, we ask ourselves, why does Paul state there 
in verse uh, in, in verse 4 that Jesus was buried. And that's an emphasis upon the fact that he was really dead. He really did die for our sins. He was a real human being and he suffered a, a real punishment from his heavenly Father. The wrath of God came firmly down upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he pours out his life unto death. And then Paul says something that's really remarkable, something that's really dramatic. We all know that people die. We all know that people are buried, but then he says that he was raised on the third day, and again he adds the words, in accordance with the scriptures. The Old Testament has references to the resurrection. Jesus talked about Jonah, right? And Jonah died, well, Jonah, he, Jonah was swallowed by the great fish, and three days later he was spewed forth. And Jesus uses that as a picture of what he would experience. He actually dies, and he comes back to life in resurrection glory. Now here, here are the, the specific elements of the gospel. Again, notice, it's the person and work of Christ. It's Christ who died for our sins. It's Christ who is buried. It's Christ who is resurrected on the third day. And then we have the elements of his work there. He died, he was buried, and he resurrected on the third day. So we come back to what Paul had stated in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, emphasis upon the person of Christ and the work of Christ. He has to be exactly who he is in order for him to accomplish exactly what he did. So we see that it's Christ, Messiah, who died for our sins. It's, it's Jesus Christ who was raised who was buried, and it's Jesus Christ who was raised on the third day. And then the elements of his redemptive work. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he was resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures. So when we speak the gospel, th this is the bare bones now. The person of Christ, the work of Christ, and then the more we learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we learn about his redemptive work, the more we can flesh out this message. We can elaborate more on who he really is, and we can elaborate <clears throat> more on what he actually accomplished. <clears throat> you remember in Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul had an encounter with a jailer. You remember, you remember that, uh, that episode there? The Apostle Paul and Silas, his co-laborer, they were out preaching, and, uh, and there was a, a woman who had a demon, fortune-telling for her owners. A and Paul cast a demon out of this woman, and the owners of this servant woman, a slave woman, they were up in arms because now their source of income, their cash cow, if you will, was dried up. So they caused a ruckus, and there's a big riot that takes place there in Philippi. And the Apostle Paul and Silas are arrested. They're put into the inner dungeon, and uh, they're in there. It's about midnight. What were they doing? They were praying and singing hymns, even though they had been beaten with rods. And then there was a great earthquake. And the Philippian jailer, who had fallen asleep, was now about to kill himself because he figured all the prisoners had escaped because of the earthquake. And Paul says, no, no, don't kill yourself. We're all here. And so the man says to Paul and Silas, what? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what does Paul say? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Now again, that's a succinct summary statement. This is what you must do if you are to be saved from your sin. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, stop and think about the Philippian jailer. You think he went to Sunday school when he was a kid? You think he went to vacation Bible school when he was a kid? He's pagan. He's a Roman. He doesn't know anything. Now, perhaps... 
He heard Paul preaching in the open air as he went to and from his home to the jail and back again. We don't know that. But he certainly heard him praying, he and Silas, and singing hymns. So I would think to myself that uh, Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. He might have questions like, who is this Jesus Christ? Explain these things to me. Well, when we look at the passage in Acts chapter 16, and these are certainly uh, words that we should have memorized. Acts chapter 16. In verse 30 is the question, what must I do to be saved? <clears throat> verse 31 is the answer. Believe in or on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. And then what do we find in the very next verse? See it? And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who are in the house. What does that lead us to believe? There's elaboration. There's an explanation. Let me tell you about the person of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the work of Jesus Christ. And this man understood, and we're told that very night, he and members of his household were, were baptized. He becomes a believer. He would become a member in the church that was established there in the town of Philippi. And, and we have a letter that the apostle wrote to the believers, the church that's at uh, Philippi, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Right? Look at, look at this. Here's another passage, a great passage that has to do with, with the content of the gospel. Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Paul states here in Romans 10 and verse 9, <clears throat> If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? Person of Christ, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Right? We should assume that has a reference to his deity. He's the sovereign Lord. Look in the Old Testament, we read about Yahweh, God's covenant name for his people. That's equatable with this statement here. Jesus is Lord. The Romans would force people to confess that Caesar was Lord, that he was deity. And the Christians would say, I can't confess Caesar as Lord because I only have one Lord, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's deity. He's, he's my God. He's my master. He's my Savior. Remember Thomas, he fell before Jesus uh, at the first Sunday after the initial resurrection. He wasn't there when Jesus had been raised on the first day of the week. And when the disciples told him, Thomas, Jesus is alive. He says, eh, I'm not going to believe that. Not until I see him. See the wounds in his hands and, and where the lance went through his side. So the Lord Jesus appears to him, John chapter 20, and uh, Thomas sees the Lord, and what does he confess? Jesus, you are my Lord, and you are my God. Right? So he recognizes the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you what? Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. If God raised him from the dead, well, he had to have been dead to be raised, and so now we have a a reference back to the cross, the, the work of Christ. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart also, he had to be a real human being if he was going to die. But God raised him from the dead. Paul says, you believe this, you'll be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, declared righteous in God's eyes. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved, for the scripture says everyone, everybody who believes in him, the person of Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. And then Paul tells us the gospel is to go out to all people. There is no difference, no distinction between Jew and Greek. But the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For anyone, everyone, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. That's the message we heard. 
that's the message by God's grace we embraced. We embraced Jesus Christ as he was presented to us in the gospel. Now, look at 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Question. How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? Another question. How are they to hear without someone preaching? Another question. How are they to preach unless they are sent? Paul keeps asking questions here. And then he makes a statement, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, the gospel. And that's how the message goes out. God saves you by his grace. You have some comprehension of who Jesus is, why he came into the world, because you're putting your faith in those gospel facts. You're embracing the Christ to whom those gospel facts point. God saves you. And then what does he expect of you? You know, someone is referred to evangelism as uh, one beggar who found bread, who now goes to other beggars and tells them where they can find bread, right? I'm better than anybody else, but by the grace of God, I'm better off than most people because I have a Lord, I have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who has saved me from my sins and who has reconciled me to God as my Father, who has placed his Holy Spirit within me, who has adopted me into his eternal family. So when, when we get the good news and we embrace Christ as he's presented to us in the good news, then it's a normal, natural desire to say, boy, I want to get this message out to others as well. Now, then we come into the fear factor, don't we? Right? Why is it that we're not all tripping over our own feet to get the gospel to peoples around us? Because we look at ourselves and say, who am I? I mean, I'm not a theologian. What if they ask me questions and I don't have answers for those questions? We look at our own inadequacies and we have a, uh, a fear of other people. What are they going to think about me? And so now, what do we do? I find in Scripture, God tells me there are things I need to do, but there is really nothing that God tells me to do in any of Scripture that I can do on my own. Why does he design it that way? Why does he design it that way? He tells me to love him with all my heart, soul, all my mind, all my strength. And I go, Lord, I fail. He tells me to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. And I say, Lord, yeah, I really love myself a lot, but I can't say I love other people as much as I, I love myself. Why does God give us commands like this that he knows that we're naturally unable to fulfill? The answer is, so we rely on him. Say, Lord, please aid me and assist me in loving you as I ought. And Lord, give me this Christ-like burden for peoples around me that are lost because I don't possess that naturally. Naturally, I'm self-absorbed. Naturally, I'm into building my own kingdom. Naturally, I'm into advancing my own agenda. But Lord, I know that that's not your agenda. I want to be concerned with the things that are precious to you. I learn about the things that are precious to my God in his word. And then when I read the word, I see where I fall short. And it's designed so that I now come to him and say, please, Lord, Give me a divine enablement. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me now to be a doer of the Word of God. It teaches us how important it is to be in the Word, right? We don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth out of the mouth of God. So we read it, and we come to him and say, I'll tell you, I pray all the time, Lord, increase my faith, help my unbelief. Increase my faith, help my unbelief. Lord, 
I see that your son had a burden for the lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Please give me this Christ-like burden for those who are outside of Christ, that I might bring the message to others and do so winsomely, graciously. And I pray, Lord, that you would open up their heart because I know they have no natural inclination for the truth of God. Their agenda is as much important to them as my agenda is to me. So this whole thing is a supernatural thing. It's an amazing thing that God uses fallen, finite human vessels to do such a great and a glorious work. And we know the gospel works because we look at ourselves, right? I tell people, if God can save me, for him, nothing's impossible. And knowing the fact that God saved me, I know he can save other people because they may not as be, be as bad as, as I was or as lost as I was. But, and, and you know, it, it doesn't even have to do with the perfection of the person who's bringing the gospel because we're all inadequate. Again, it's a testimony to the grace of God that he uses the likes of us to be involved in his work, which, uh, which is a high privilege, and, and that there are people that we talk to who eventually become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we might not see it in our own day and age, but down the road, the Lord may bring word of that uh, to our attention. We know our labor in the Lord is, is never in vain. But we, we come back here, we we're talking about the person, Christ, the work of Christ, and the importance of us taking the message to other people. You know, one of the things that happens when we go out and we speak with uh, others is that we learn what we really don't know. Right? You start talking with people, they ask you a question, and you're standing there and you're going, I don't know the answer to that one. Now, if you're really serious about gospel ministry, what are you going to do? You got stumped. You say, ah, you know, I'm calling it a day. I'm going home. I'm just going to sit and watch TV now. I'm not doing this anymore. Now, if you're really concerned and you get stumped, what are you going to do? And I know the answers are in this word. I may not know where they are right now, but I got to do my homework. If we're reading the Bible, we're going to have questions. If we're using the Bible and we're talking with other people, and they're going to give us questions, and we're going to go, well, I never thought about that one before. But now we go back home, we do our research. We talk to our pastor. We talk to our elders. We uh, come to our Sunday school with greater interest than ever before. And we find out, wow, the Sunday school teacher happens to be discussing right now that very question that was posed to me a couple of days ago when I was out sharing the good news with, with somebody. Or the pastor happens to be dealing with that particular subject matter or something related to it in a sermon. Now, what's happening? This is revolutionizing everything about our Christian experience. Because now we don't just go to church because, well, it's Sunday, I go to church, and I sit there and I listen. I don't see how any of this stuff relates to me. But now I'm going with a renewed interest because I need to know answers. The people who want answers are people who have questions. You've got to have hooks to hang this information on. If you don't have any hooks there, you're just taking information in. You say, I don't know what this has to do with anything, but I guess it's good. But when you need answers, you appreciate answers, you assimilate that information, and then you're better ready next time you go out on the field, and you're, you're actually praying, Lord, I hope somebody asks me that question again because now I know the answer. And the more we use the information God gives us, what happens? It becomes more ingrained in our mind. People say to me, how do you remember these different Bible verses that you know? You know how I remember them? I just keep looking at them over and over again. Here's something I found. In, in, in the many years I've been doing evangelism, the devil is the most uh, unimaginative creature 
that, that exists on the earth. Why do I say that? Well, I listen to the arguments of unbelievers. You know what I find? There's maybe about, I'm just guessing here, 17, 18, 19, maybe as many as 20. The devil has these excuses and arguments that unbelievers buy into, and they just simply regurgitate these same old arguments. So if you are doing evangelism long enough, you understand what these 15, 20 questions are, and you learn how to answer them pretty straightforwardly. They may come in different wrappers and different packaging, but he's really very boring. The devil is incredibly boring. Very uninventive, very uncreative. So if we're involved in evangelism long enough, remember we're relying on the Lord, Lord, I need you to give me wisdom, bring to my remembrance the things that I've read and studied in your word, but then those questions that really were really difficult and hard questions at one time, you just think to yourself, okay, Lord, here we go with this one again, so just help me to be gracious. That's another interesting thing. There are people that uh, they're very harsh in presenting the gospel to other people. Kind of condescending when they're speaking the gospel to other people. And if you're being uh, opposed, it's kind of a natural thing to respond in like. But then, as I've been doing this open-air preaching for many years, I realized to myself, I have the most gracious message that has ever been given to a human being. All right? God so loved the world. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish in their sin, but should have everlasting or eternal life. God could have just given all of us our just desserts. The wages of sin is death. You've sinned. Here's the consequences. I'm a just God. I'm the judge of all the universe. You violated my laws. You violated my standards. Here's the lake of fire. And I know I deserve the hottest part in the lake of fire. But God brought some, many people to me with the gospel. And as I said before, by grace I believed it. He's a gracious God. Save sinners. Reconcile sinners to himself. How can I be harsh or angry or mean when I'm talking to unbelievers about this gracious message of Jesus Christ? If they don't want to hear it, if they respond uh, with, 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 with anger, well, you know, I know the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, ready to teach, patient, instructing those who oppose themselves, praying that God would grant them repentance to acknowledging the truth. And so that's another thing we're learning as we go out to people. Give me this Christ-like burden. Give me this, this attitude that I find in my Lord Jesus, who is said to be a friend of sinners. I, I want to go out there with good news. I want to go out there with a smile on my face, with joy in my heart. Not only am I saved through the gospel, but now I'm privileged to bring the gospel to people who are not saved. Sometimes, especially when you do an open-air type work, you're talking to the choir. You know what? The choir needs to hear the good news again and again. I preach the gospel thousands and thousands of times. Do you think it becomes old hat or boring to me? I just think on the content of the message as I'm preaching it and thinking, this is so amazing. This is so astounding. That this plan is, 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 is so glorious and, and so supernatural and, and so fascinating that I'm understanding more and more, better and better as time goes on. So we need to look to the Lord in our weakness and our inability and our inadequacy. Those are all good things to admit to the Lord. Lord, I'm incompetent. I'm inept. I'm a loser. But Lord, I have a victory in your son, Jesus Christ. So please enable me now as I go out to share the gospel with others or as you bring people into my life Help me in a gracious manner to speak it to others. Give me open doors.
Give me an open mouth. Give them an open heart. Use me to encourage believers and use me as salt and light as I deal with the, the unbelievers around me. Um, tell you what, let's, let's pause a second. And let me ask you now, I've been kind of just sort of going on and on. Based on anything I said, question in your mind, what about this? Can you elaborate on that? Let's, let's take, take a question or so. One of the things that you were um, explaining is the gospel pretty much from the beginning to um, Christ's resurrection. Do you find it harder to um, maybe speak with someone who uh, already knows those types of things and have already either rejected that or... Um, it almost sounds like from when you're speaking that you are starting all the way from ground zero with people. Um, sometimes people aren't starting at ground zero. Sometimes they're starting um, from a space of really knowing their Bible but have rejected it. How do you, do you go at them a little bit differently? Do you go at them again from ground zero? How do you usually handle that? When we're doing evangelism, one of the most important things to be is a good listener. Very often, we're ready and wanting to talk. So we should, first of all, in, in, in a conversation with somebody, we should be good listeners. And an important part of this is learning to ask questions because I really want to find out if I'm starting at ground zero. Or if we, I met a, 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 Nick and I were out uh, doing ministry on uh, was it Friday. I don't even know what today is. But we were out doing ministry. We met a Chinese fellow out there from China. He was in the States briefly. And I asked him what his, uh, his, background was, if he, if he was a Buddhist, if he had any religious background. He says, well, my wife's a Buddhist, uh, but uh, he says, I'm not. I said, well, would you call yourself an atheist? Question, right? Oh, no, no, I'm not an atheist. I said, would you call yourself an agnostic? He says, yeah, that's what I would be. And so I said to him, how do you think that, you know, we got here if you're an agnostic? And he said, well, I'm not sure the answer to that. And so I began to speak with him about the whole design thing. I said, uh, his name was Un. I said, you see your, your eyeglasses? Do you believe they just happened? He said, no. I said, your shirt. Is there a designer behind your shirt, a, a manufacturer? He says, yeah. I mean, he was sort of like, Amazed that I'm asking these very simplistic questions. But then he got it as I went on, saying, well, if, if, if this automobile had to have a designer and a manufacturer and your sunglasses needed to have such and your shirt did, well, look at the complexity of the world around us. And he said to me, I see what you're saying. I see where you're coming from. And he said, maybe I'm halfway between being uh, an agnostic and being a theist. Now, just to be a theist, according to the writers of Scripture, questioning the Creator is really illogical and irrational and unreasonable because, as David put it in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Or as David says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. All of these things are testimonies to us that there has to be a divine Creator. Now, as I'm talking with this Chinese fellow, you know, I'm picking his brain. I'm trying to find out what he knows, what he doesn't know. And, and I said to him, I said, Un, I know you exist. I knew you existed when I laid my eyes on you. I assumed certain things, that you were from the Orient. I didn't know exactly where but I know what your name is, I know you're married, I know your wife is a professing Buddhist, I know why you came to the United States, I know that you came to the United States prior, you went to San Diego. I said, how do I know these things? You know what he said to me? He said, well, I told you these things. 
Okay, I'm being a good listener. Okay, and I said, this is, this is how it is. I look at creation and I say, got to be a creator. This didn't just all happen. It makes logical sense that the painting you see in the art gallery had an artist behind it. And then somebody put a frame on it and then somebody hung it up. It didn't just happen. So I know God is the creator, but oh, and how do I know about you? Well, I told you things about me. I said, Amen. That's it. I know God is the great creator, but he talks to me in specific terms about himself when I look in Holy Scripture. And so we need to read our Bible. I think one of the greatest one of the greatest blessings I can challenge an unbeliever with is to know the contents of the Bible. I said to him, do you have a Bible? He says, yeah, I got one in English and I got one in, in Mandarin. I said, you got to read it. Because we're not asking people to put faith in faith. We're not asking people to take some leap of blind faith, some leap into the darkness. No, that's antithetical. Remember, we talked about the facts of Scripture. This is who the real Jesus is. This is what the real Jesus did. This is what God requires of you. As a human being, you need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't want to believe in a Jesus you don't know anything about. You don't want to put your faith in someone that's, that, that, that you have no information about. So I said, you've got to read the Word. Now, in that particular case, we had this conversation before I did the, the open-air preaching, but Un stood there. And then he got these gospel facts, and then afterward he stayed there, and Nick and I continued to speak with him, and he was very interested because now we had talked about creation, we had talked about the importance of God's word, that he tells us things about himself in the Bible that we could not otherwise know. And uh, he heard the, the gospel components. He was challenged in the presentation of the open-air preaching to repent and believe. And I'm sure he still has more questions, but I believe he was a lot closer to the kingdom at the end of the conversation than when we began. So if you're talking with Aunt Jane, you know a lot more about Aunt Jane than you might have known about Oom when you just encountered a stranger in a public place like Mallory Square. So, and, you know, and, and, and different people are going to have different objections. Some of those people, you'll know what their objections are uh, prior to a conversation because you've maybe tried to broach this subject matter before and you find a, 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 um, uh, them being much more closed. But you see, it's, it's the word of God that we want to communicate to people. Now, sometimes it will be a, a one-on-one -on -one back and forth exchange. Other times, if Aunt Jane has shown herself to be closed in the past, you might say, um, well, here's a good gospel tract I came across. I would approach Aunt Jane and say, you know, Aunt Jane, I came across something that, that I found really interesting. And, and I'd like to give this to you in, 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 you know, in your own good time. You know, please read it through and let me know what you think about it. When I add that, let me know what you think about it. That's me telling her that I'm really interested in her opinion and, and what she thinks. Or it might be a booklet, you know, ultimate questions booklet, whatever. Or maybe it's a book that you've read. And you think this is, this is really a good booklet, good book, and I'm going to leave it with such a person. And then after a week or two, hey, Aunt Jane, did you uh, happen to have time? She might have forgot about it. The fact that you brought it up again, you know, I actually didn't look at it. Okay, well, you know, well, let me know, right? So we're, we're, we're actively and consciously interested. That's an important thing. You have to be interested in people. They're not just objects that we're throwing some information at. We have to have a Christ-like concern for these people. Again, where are we going to get that? We're going to get it by going to the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, I know that you're concerned about the lost, Please, I want you to, to make that my reality. The more we pray about it. In Matthew 4, let me, let me show you this. this. This to me is helpful. Matthew chapter 4, Lord Jesus is beginning his, uh, his earthly ministry. 
Matthew chapter 4. And he's calling his, uh, his disciples to himself. You see in verse 18? Look at verse 18, 19, 20 in Matthew chapter 4. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, the Lord Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. What are they doing? They're doing what they do every day. It was their business. They were fishermen, and so they're casting a net into the sea. Verse 19, Jesus says to them, what? This is what your duty is. You're going to be my disciples. The chief responsibility of a disciple is to follow his master. My primary concern needs to be following my master, my Lord Jesus. If I'm his disciple, I need to be hanging on his every word. Where am I going to find his word? Right here, Holy Scripture, right? So Jesus says, your primary concern is me. You look to me, you rely on me, you follow me. You build your life around me because of who I am. That's full time, right? That's not some hobby that I'm involved in. That's my full occupation. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I follow him. Now, he makes a promise there. See what the promise is? If you fulfill your end of the bargain, follow me, he says, this is what I'm going to do for you. What's he going to do? He says, I will make you fishers of men. It's not me making myself a fisher of men. I'm following Jesus. He is making me a fisher of men. And notice, this is a process. When we read the Gospels, we read about Peter, we read about John, Andrew, James. We read about the apostles. Perfect people or flawed people? Flawed, majorly, right? So, three years now, they're with the Lord Jesus. They watch him, they listen to him, they eat with him, they see his miracles. They're imbibing, absorbing his words, his actions, his concerns about people. He dies for them at the cross of Calvary. He's buried. He's resurrected. They're witnesses not only of his life, but of his death, his burial, his resurrection. He ascends into heaven. But before he ascends into heaven, what does he tell them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? He says, you're going to be my witnesses. Right? What's a witness? Someone who's seen and someone who's heard. They were with Jesus. They heard him. And all the time, what's he doing? He's making them. He's preparing them to be fishers of men. Holy Spirit comes down at Pentecost. What do they do? They're out there preaching the word. We go through the book of Acts. Not all the apostles are focused on, but we know that they went out with the gospel as fishers of men, and by God's grace, there were results. There were people who repented and believed. Many didn't repent and believe, but their blood be on their own head. Those men did what was required of them. So we see here that our primary concern is to follow the Lord Jesus and, 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 and desire of him to do what he promises to do, to make us fishers of men, and it's going to be a process. You know, when I first went out to preach at Mallory Square some 32 plus years ago, you know what it was like to go out there? It was horrendous. I used to pray for rain every day. Why would I pray for rain every day? I was very reluctant. I didn't want to go out there and stand up in front of a bunch of these people. I know straight away they're not interested in what I have to say. Why did I go out? Obedience. Jesus said, follow me. He's concerned about the lost. Lord, I'm not as concerned about the lost as you are. He says, 
You're not telling me anything new. I know that. Okay? He's working with flawed human beings. So we say, okay, I'm going to be obedient. I know that this is close to your heart. This is important to you. You're my master. I'm following you. So what's important to you has to become important to me. So I go out, terrified. Next time I go out, just as terrified. Maybe more so, because I already went once, and it didn't go so good. But you keep doing it over and over. And you know what you find? God is faithful. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before.